really right in the middle of a series of uh, Moses and God talking back and forth. And Moses keeps giving objections. And really this last point here, this last part of this series is that uh, God comes back and he says, listen, Moses, all of these objections uh, I've already answered and I'm giving you everything that you need to obey me. Right now, you're going to have everything that you need. Now, I, I'm, he's about to go on a journey. And I don't know if you're anybody else is like this. It's going to be honest enough to admit it. Like whenever I go on a trip, I am super paranoid that I'm going to forget something. Anybody else like that where you got to like overpack, you got to check like 14 times if you have the right uh, amount of socks and the right color of socks and, and check the, the toothbrushes and the toothpaste and, and all of that. Like I, I get paranoid and uh, I end up packing like 14 bags, right? And Beth is like, you are a woman. And I'm like, I'm not. I'm just really paranoid because uh, I, I just, I want to make sure I don't forget something. Although the last couple times, my problem hasn't been that I forgot something, but rather I forgot to remove something. Because if you go on to the, on the airplane now, uh, I always have the personal bag with my backpack, and there's like 20 different pockets in my backpack, and I always forget to like make sure to look through every single one of those tiny little pockets. And so one time I went through, I put my bag through, and then I like dinged, and they're like, "Sir, come here," and I'm like, oh, "What's going on?" And he pulls out pocket knife, and I'm like, "Ah, it's like you weren't supposed to see that. Should probably word that better." But like that's not. You know, it's like, so he threw it away, right? And there's another time whenever I was given, and like, I never buy a cologne for myself because that's like a weird thing to buy. Uh, but like, I, that's just not my thing. But I was given like a fancy bottle of cologne. It was like the only one that I've ever owned. I was given it, it probably like cost like 70, 80 bucks. Like it was a, a nice gift that somebody cared enough to like buy me and give it to me for Christmas. And I had put it in my backpack and I went through the screening without thinking, oh yeah, cologne is water. Like that's expensive water, smelly water. And, uh, but I went through there and it dinged and he's like he pulled it out he's like sir what is this I'm like it is a Christmas present Uh, he's like you can't bring this out and he threw it in the trash and I'm like no that was the most expensive water I've ever owned But you, you might be like that, where you're, you're a little paranoid, where you want to make sure that you have it, all your bases covered here. And this is what Moses is doing today. He's going to come back at God and say, listen, 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 God, I'm not prepared for this. I'm not prepared for this. Have you thought about this, God? And every single time, God says, listen, Moses, I'm already ahead of you on this. I've already thought through this. You are going to have exactly what you need to accomplish my will today. And so we're going to get in Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. One, let me pray one more time before we get into it. Father, I pray that you would be with us now as we open up your word. I, I pray that your word would be proclaimed boldly, that I, I would be forgotten in the background, Lord, and that you would shine forth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Verse four, it says, Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe you, or listen to me. They will not believe me, or listen to my voice. For they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. All right, so if you were here the last couple weeks, actually, this is now the third objection that Moses is going to give God. The first thing, he's like, God, whenever God came to him and said, God, uh, Moses, I'm going to send you back into Egypt, he said, but who am I? Why, why'd you pick me? I'm a nobody. Why, why are you bothering to talk to me here? And God said, well, you are, but I'm going to be with you, and that's the important part. So he answered that objection. Then last week, he's like, but God, what if they ask me what your name is? I don't even know who you are, what your name is. And so God God says, my name is Yahweh. And we talked through all of that there. And then now he gives this third objection where he says, but behold, you know what that would be translated as? Something that we've all heard before. But mom, <laughs> but dad, like I think every single parent knows he's just kind of whining at this point. He's saying, but God, and he says, but behold, and behold means look. So he's like, but look, God, but look, which is a dumb thing to say to God because God is like, listen, I can see all creation, all history happening at once. I can see every single nook and cranny of the entire universe, and you're telling me to look? (laughs) You're you're telling me that I haven't seen something here? But that is Moses' response. He's saying, like, but but look, but look, God, you you haven't fully uh, thought through things here. He says, they won't believe me. They won't listen to me, which... In some respects, I think is a good argument, in some respects, because, for instance, let's say you don't know me very well, and uh, I'm walking around outside, and then I come inside, and I'm going to say, hey, guys, guys, stop the service, stop the service. I was walking outside. There was a bush on fire. It spoke to me. 
pretty sure it was God. And so we're going to need to all leave and go and quit our jobs and go leave our houses. And, and we're going to go walk towards a big red sea. Like that, that, that is ultimately what he's about ready to say. And so in some regards, it's like, okay, this is a legitimate concern, legitimate excuse here for Moses, except for that it wasn't. And here's the reason why, because he says, what they will not believe me, the they who he is talking about is not Pharaoh yet. It's actually, he's still just talking about all the other elders, all the other Israelites right now. He's saying, the Israelites aren't going to believe me that, that I'm going to tell them to come on out of Egypt. And the problem with that is, if you go back to verse 18 of chapter 3, God says, you're going to talk to them and they're going to believe you. Now, it's been a week since we've looked at that, but that's been like literally one minute. (laughs) And so God says, all right, you're going to talk to them. They're going to believe you. And he's like, but God, they're not going to believe me. It's like, did I stutter? (laughs) Like, Why aren't you believing me right now, Moses? So Moses is just struggling with unbelief right now, not believing that God is actually going to be true to his word, that God is going to do what he says that he does. So he says, they're not going to believe me, that you appear to me. And so in verse two, the Lord comes back and the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. Now I brought a little, uh, a tool with me today here. I brought my own staff. All right. So number one, if you, uh, feel like sleeping this Sunday, I would recommend not, all right? I don't usually uh, come prepared with a weapon. Uh, no, this is a, it's my social distancing stick, all right? So don't get near me, all right? I need this on an airplane or something, I don't know, but once again, I'd get thrown off. Um, but he had a staff, which is, number one, it's a weird question that God would ask, in my opinion, because number one, he's like, God, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? And God, who can see everything, uh, is like asking Moses, what's in his hand? Moses is probably like, it's a staff? Like, why are, you, why are you asking me? It's like whenever I ask my little one-year-old boy, Levi, what's in his mouth? Um, which, by the way, if you ever ask a one-year-old what's in his mouth, they all of a t- sudden turn into an Olympic sprinter. <laughs> it's like, what's in your mouth, Levi? Gotta go. <laughs> it's like, where, where did this kid get this feet from? But, but so Moses asks, what's in your hand? And he comes back, a staff is in my hand, which a staff for a shepherd is literally everything. It's the thing that would keep the sheep in line. It, it would protect protect them. It would keep them out of uh, ditches and holes. He, he would hit them. He would tap them. He would correct them. Whenever there was a, uh, an animal, like a lion or something like that, that was going to attack them, it was his weapon. It would keep them back at bay. If, there's a, if the robber came, this is also still his weapon. This was what he used so often. This was the most important possession that he had as a shepherd here. And God said, hey, what, what's in your hand? God knew what was in his hand, but he wanted to take Moses and say, you're going to acknowledge this. This is just just my staff. This is just an ordinary stick. That's all it ever was. But yet, this is the first tool that God uses. And so I'm going to give you four different tools that God uses here. And this first one, this first one, first point, Yoakum, if you can hit that for me. Um, This first point is that God will use what we already have. God will use what we already have. We're going to look at four tools that Moses had right now, and we're going to see some spiritual principles that we can look at and apply as well. And this very first thing was that God was going to use just his normal, everyday, normal staff to do something miraculous from it. And God will use that for us as well. For us, we have relationships. We have occupations. We have all sorts of tools at our disposal. And sometimes we kind of get in this mode of thinking, well, if only I had, if only I had a, you know, a Bible school degree like Pastor Devin does, or if only I had uh, more money, then I could finally give. If I got that promotion, then I could be generous. We always want to put out and say, no, 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 I need something else before I can be used by God. But God is going to clearly say, no, 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 I, I've already given it to you. I can use what's already in your hands. Some of you, like right now, you're, you're holding this and you're checking Facebook, your cell phone right now, right? And some of you have been sharing cat memes for 20 years, and God's like, you could do something more productive with the phone than that. God can use what we already have. And so in verse three, it gets interesting. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses ran from it. So he's now holding the staff. And so he's like, what is it? And Moses like, it's a staff. <laughs> if you didn't know God. And he's like, all right, throw it on the ground. So Moses throws it on the ground 
and then immediately it becomes a snake. And then I love this part because it says, and Moses ran from it as a good and godly man should. All right? I, I hate snakes, all right? And whenever I was uh, in high school, I was on a mission trip down in Mexico, and we were like helping plant a, a grove, a, like an orange grove down in Mexico. And uh, we were out there in the middle of the wilderness, but at the end of the day, we were just sitting out on the porch, and we saw the missionary uh, drive up in his truck, and he had his hand out his window, and it looked like he was carrying a stick out the window. And we're like, what is that? And finally got close enough, and he turned right in front of us. He's like, hey, guys, guess what? I caught a rattlesnake, <laughs> and he's just holding it out the window. Now, then he gets out of the car and starts walking towards us. And I was a teenage boy, and there were teenage girls around here, so I wanted to look good, but I ran. I, like, legit just got up, and I sprinted, because once again, I'm a godly man, and I hate snakes. And so I, I, I ran away. I, I, I do not like this at all. And so I love this, because this is, by the way, Moses writing it. And so I do have to give him props that he was honest here, because normally whenever a guy writes a story, he's like, you know, I saw a snake, and I stepped on it with my bare feet, you know, like trying to, try to act tough. But no, Moses is being honest. He's like, I saw a snake. I ran from the snake, because that's what you do. <laughs> but in all honesty, though, he had been a shepherd now for 40 years. He'd been a shepherd for 40 years. So I think that he probably actually came in contact with a lot of snakes, and he would know exactly which ones you should run from. He would know. And he saw this, and he knew instantly, I got to get out of here. <laughs> and so I, we don't know what type of snake it was. Personally, I think it, if I had to take a guess, it was probably a cobra. Those were very common in that p time period there. And then it's also one, that and rattlesnakes, like you instantly know. Everybody instantly knows that's a snake you, you don't mess with. You don't have to like count the, you know, is it red, white, black, like stripes or whatever like that. You just instantly know a cobra. You, you get out there. And so it apparently was one, at least a snake that he instantly knew, but also then, if it was a cobra, cobras were very important for Egyptians. It was really one of the, the, the cobra actually was a god. They, they deemed him as gods. And so if you ever see a picture of a pharaoh um, with, his, uh, with his crown on, you'll notice that there's actually a cobra coming out the front, signifying that, that the pharaoh now has the power of the cobra god on him, that he is speaking on behalf of him. And so whether it was that or whether it was another one, we, we can't say for sure, but I kind of like that theory. But then... He runs from it, but then look what he says next. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. Now, number one, I just need to do a PSA disclaimer. Like, if you find a poisonous snake, don't grab it by its tail. <laughs> Some of you are like, but the Bible says. No, don't, like, don't do that. That's not the point of the message here. But, but right now, God told Moses, go ahead, grab it by its tail. And he picked it up. And it became the staff again, instantly. Which I would have trust issues with this staff, by the way. Like, I'd be like, but I'm not sleeping with it in my room, God. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna leave that over there. Uh, but, but in this moment here, I think the principle that he's being taught here is that the power of Egypt, the power of their gods is nothing. It's nothing here. That, that God has the power to overcome anything that they might do. And they're going to try to do something. They're going to try to replicate this. We're going to see this in a few weeks. But God has more power than that. In verse 5 it says, That they might believe that the Lord, the God of the fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And this is the reason why he was going to do miracles. This is the reason why God did miracles all throughout the Bible, so that we might believe. This is the reason why God does miracles even today. I believe in that. And he does it, not just so we can share a cool story, not so we can, you know, write a book deal or anything like that. He does it so that we might believe in him. That's the reason why. And so in verse 6 now, it says again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And so they would often wear kind of like an undergarment and then they would wear a heavier cloak over top of that. And so I love it too because like he's not really telling Moses what's going to happen next. He's just like, I need you to believe me. Just do this and see what happens. And so he's like, put your hand inside of his cloak. And I was like, 
did Moses think his hand's going to turn into a snake right now? I was like, snake hands. I don't know what, what was going on inside of Moses. That's what would be going on inside my head. I messed up. But, um, so he puts his hand inside of the clo- cloak. He pulls it out, and now it's all leprous like snow. In that time period, that was the most feared disease that you could imagine. It, it was one that there was absolutely no possible recovery from. In fact, it was just a sentence to a horrible, horrible death. It was very commonplace, and so whenever in leprosy, it it would literally kind of like rot your skin away. You couldn't feel the nerves in it. And so you would hit things, you'd scratch things and you couldn't feel it. And, and eventually your skin would just start to fall off and it was all pus filled. And it was just, it was a disgusting disease. It was a horrible disease. Whenever somebody caught it, you would be sent out to a leprosy colony and those people would live and you would not come anywhere near anyone else. In fact, actually later on, Egypt tried to spend all their smartest guys, all their best magicians, all their best scientists, all their best doctors to try to solve leprosy, and they never could. And God says, listen, put your hand inside your cloak, pulls it out. And at that moment, he probably would prefer the snake. <laughs> Because he's singing that this is, you're going to send me in with leprosy? You're, you're going to condemn me to this? But then in the next verse, God says, Put your hand back inside your cloak. He put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. So he puts it back in, he brings it back out, and all of a sudden it's fine because God has more power than that. God has power over diseases as well. Let me just occasionally remind her, God is more powerful than COVID. I hope you know that. Now, that doesn't mean just like they had laws for leprosy and, and try to limit the spread and, and they, in the Old Testament. And so I'm not, not complaining about that. I'm just saying, don't put your trust in any of that. Put your trust in God. God's more powerful than that. Any disease. And so this is what happens. God has, heals him. And now he's looking at his hand. Once again, Moses is saying, I, I'm not the right guy. I don't have it within me. And God's saying, I can use even your hand. That brings us to the next point in your bulletin is that... The next tool that God used for Moses was his hand, his hand. And I think that teaches us that God will use normal things. God will use the normal everyday things in your life to do something powerful. He doesn't need you to win the lottery before you can actually serve him. He doesn't need you to have your PhD before you can serve him. God is going to use just the normal everyday relationships, the normal everyday activities, the normal everyday job that you have. He's going to use that, and he's using it for his glory if you allow it. Verse 8 now. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign which is weird terminology for God to use, honestly, because he's like, they might believe the first one, but if they don't believe that one, maybe they'll believe the second one. It's like, shouldn't you already know this God? (laughs) Out of anyone, he can see the future. I think what the principle that he's saying here is some people are gonna believe after the first thing. Some people are gonna take a second sign to believe, and some are even gonna take a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. And so in the next verse here, verse nine, it says, if they will not believe, even those two signs, or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on, on the ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. And so this sign, Moses doesn't actually do himself right now because he's not anywhere near the Nile. And so he can't take a cup of it. But, but in reality, that's now asking even more of Moses because he's saying, hey, Moses, you're going to go in front of Pharaoh right now and you're going to have to perform this miracle and you've never done it before. <laughs> that's like putting you on the spot here. That's something that nobody likes to be doing. I mean, put up on the spot, put up on a pedestal. And then he's like got a cup and he's like, I really hope this works because <laughs> if it drops out and it remains water, I'm done for. But even more than that, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, and we'll talk even more about it in a couple more weeks. But the Nile uh, was also another god for Egypt. Uh, the Egyptians had a bunch of gods, just like the Romans, just like the Greeks. They, they, all the cultures back then had all these different gods. And one of the most powerful and important god was the god of the Nile, because that is where all of life came from for Egypt. Even to this day, it's one of the most condensely populated countries in the entire world, because it's all just right on the banks of the Nile. All of life, every single morning, that's where they'd get water to feed themselves, feed their animals, wash their clothes, get water to drink. Like literally everything came back to the Nile. It It was their most powerful God. And then what God is going to do is going to come in here with Moses and say, listen, 
that powerful God that you have, I just turned it into a pool of blood. Without getting too gory, he's saying, Yahweh just killed your God. (laughs) Who's more powerful now? And and so this in this moment here, this is going to be a pretty bold statement for Moses to actually be called into here. And he's starting to realize just what the big, grandiose vision that God has for him. So in verse 10, though, he comes back with another, another objection. Now, the fourth objection. He says, but Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. So he comes back and he says, listen, God, I don't speak that gooder like than other people, right? I don't, I don't have the right words to say. I, don't, I can't articulate myself very well here. And, and that's a, probably something that a lot of us relate to. I, I was looking at statistics and, and uh, the most feared thing for a lot of people, it's like number two is death. And number one is public speaking. <laughs> like, and so, like some of y'all would be like, you, I would rather die <laughs> than have to get up. And the, I'm, I'm getting over it. I've only like puked three times today. Like, I'm fine. I'm getting there. No, I, I actually, I do relate to this. So, and I, I understand it well. Uh, I'm going to do something. I love you guys. Uh, I love you. And that's why I'm doing it. Because otherwise, if I didn't love you, I want to I wanna expose myself uh, like this, my history like this. But I want to show you a little clip uh, from my childhood, one of the few clips that I have from my childhood. Because you're going to notice something. Um, hopefully, you notice a few things have changed about, about me. Uh, but, uh, but I want to play this short little clip here um, to show that I can relate to Moses. You want to play? that. All right, so that was me. I was like a three or four year old uh, there. And uh, uh, number one, if you like, why did they call you Matthew? Watch last week's sermon. That means you missed. I explained that last week. Uh, <laughs> but you probably noticed that uh, you had no idea what in the world I said at any point in that video, right? Um, and then join the club, right? I had no idea what I was talking about uh, back then either. I actually had a severe speech impediment for the first several years of my life. I had to go to therapy. Uh, all throughout my childhood in order that I could learn how to articulate things better. So I understand this from Moses. From Moses, I mean, yeah, I was a cute kid. Of course, we all agree on that. But... (laughs) But growing up, I, I struggled with that. I struggled with uh, having the confidence to get up and to speak because that was my history as well. I, I understand this from Moses. But then look at what God says in response to that. In verse 11 now, it says, Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? I love this response because Moses says, I can't speak well. I don't have the right words. I'm slow to speech. I maybe have a stutter. I maybe have a speech impediment. Well, you don't know here, but he says, I can't speak very well, God. And God's response is, who made your mouth, Moses? <laughs> I made your mouth, and I made it on purpose for this reason here. And then notice how big of a statement that next statement is. Who makes the mute, the deaf, or seen, or the blind? God right now is taking credit for all the disabilities in the world. He's saying, I I made you like that. I made people blind. I made people deaf. I made people mute here. And listen, God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes. And that's why we're pro-life here. That's why we don't think that that God has ever made a mistake on any single one of us. And and now your, your issues might not be deaf or blind or seen or anything like that. But I know that there's a lot of us that struggle with chronic illness. And we say, God, why? Why have you given me this? There's so much more that I want to do. There's so much more that I want to give. And I just, I can't, I hurt. I, I can't, I can't do this. And, and we say, we ask God or, or some of us are struggling with depression and anxiety and all sorts of things that nobody else can see. And we say, God, why are you doing this to me? Why can't you just take this away? God says, I created you on purpose. And sometimes it's so that you will lean in and trust me even more. 
I heard the story of Fanny Crosby, the prolific hymn writer, state that when a preacher came to her and said, isn't it a shame that you were born blind? She came back and she said, if I could ask God for one thing, it would be to be born blind. That way, whenever I get to heaven, the first face that I'm ever going to see is that of Jesus. God does these things. God is in power over these things. And look at, actually in verse 12, it says, now therefore go, therefore builds off of what he said, therefore because you have these these issues, go and I will be your mouth and I will teach you what you should say, how to speak. And, And so if Moses didn't have this issue, I don't think God would have been able to say, you need to rely on me even more to say what I wanna say. Moses might've got a little confident and starting to wanna say what he wants to say and God says, no, no, no. I created you so that you could lean on me and say the things that I want you to say. And that's the next point in your bulletin is that the next tool that God gave us is the mouth. God gave Moses his mouth and even he felt like it was deficient, but God cares more about our availability than our ability. God cares more about your availability than your ability. You might feel like you don't have very much to offer. You might feel like there are things uh, that that says uh, I can't in the past. Even like for Moses, he said, there's things in my past. I've never been able to speak well. That might be your story as well, but God doesn't care about that. He can overcome that very easily. He can give you the words to say. He can give you the strength to fight the battle. He can go through all of this. He cares more about our availability. Are we willing to say yes to him? Verse 13 now. But he said, oh my Lord, please send someone else. And we finally get to the heart of the matter. (laughs) Tell us how you really feel. Finally, Moses, for the first time, I think is completely honest. And he says, listen, just please send somebody else. (laughs) I'm out of excuses. I don't have any other things that I can make up on the spot here of why you shouldn't send me. I just really don't want to do it, God. And so Moses now hears God's response as well in verse 14. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Literally, his face turned red is the idea in the Hebrew. And he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. So Moses says, please send somebody else. And God's response is, I'm not going to send anyone else, but I am going to send somebody beside you. And I've always kind of read this story, thought of this story as like this was accommodation by God, that God didn't really plan on this, but rather uh, because Moses just kept complaining, finally God was like, sometimes the same thing I do with my kids of like, I'm not going to give in, but I'll give you a little bit. Like, here's a, here's a buddy for you. This will help you. Just, just stop complaining. But that's not really the case. Because if you notice the very end there, it says, behold, he is coming out to you. Did you catch it? Some of your translations will actually say, behold, Aaron is already on his way. Meaning that before, and before Moses came and said, God, please send somebody else. Please let anyone do it. God had already talked to Aaron and said, Aaron, go out and meet Moses. Meaning that God had already created a plan for Moses' objection. Moses hadn't brought his objection yet to the Lord, and yet God has already said, I already got a plan for you, Moses. I've already knew that this was going to be a problem. I already knew that you weren't going to be strong enough. I already knew that you were going to need help, and he has already sent somebody along to help him. And the last point in your bulletin is this, is that the last tool that Moses had was his friends. In this case, his brother, Aaron, which we'll get to know very well as the weeks go on. But he sends our friends. He sends this community. This is why church is so important because there are certain times where you will not be strong enough to do everything that God has called you to. That's why we need each other. That's why we need brothers and sisters to come alongside and God will send others to help you. Let's finish up here. Verse 15, you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth and I will be your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. Verse 16, he shall speak for you to the people and he shall be your mouth and you shall be as God to him. So he said, now I'm gonna not only teach Moses what to say, I'm also gonna teach Aaron what to say. And then that last phrase is a little bit interesting. I can't think of any other time when God really said this to a man. He said, you're gonna be God to him, 
as God to him, Elohim to him there. And, and the reason is, the rationale is because Moses is going to just be speaking uh, God's words. So God is going to speak to Moses directly, and then Moses was just going to recite God's words over to Aaron, so Aaron could recite God's words to other people. And that's what, as a pastor here, let me just say this um, my authority as a pastor, and I do have some authority, spiritual authority over your life if you consider me your pastor, but it's only when I can say, thus saith the Lord. When I can say, this is what God's word says. Don't, don't listen to somebody that comes up to you and says, I got a word from the Lord, and then they don't actually have their Bible with them because that's not a word from the Lord. That's a word from them, right? So my authority, a pastor's authority, spiritual a person in your authority only goes so far as the word of God goes. And this is what he says here. You're going to be as God to him. But in the last verse, it says, And take your hand, this staff, with which you shall do the signs. Grab my staff one more time here. I was kind of thinking, I got a little bit curious. It's like, why did, why did God even make a big point about the staff? The staff comes in handy. It's really the one that, the thing by which God was going to do all these miracles uh, throughout this whole time for Moses and even split the Red Sea. But like really, God didn't need to use a staff if you think about it. If he wanted a, a snake to appear, Moses could have snapped his fingers. God was able to do it that way. If he wanted to part the Red Sea, Moses could have waved his hands and, and then the Red Sea start to part here. He didn't, he didn't actually need a staff. And so I was like, why did God make a, such a big deal out of the staff? I, I started to, do some research here. I ran across a picture. You probably have seen it very well as, uh, a few times as well, museums and things like that. But that's one of the mummies. I'm not sure which fair it was, but you'll notice that for oftentimes, you've probably seen these pictures before, they're holding a couple different things, right? They're holding one, the kind of a scepter with the, the, the things hanging down. But, th but then in the other hand, you'll notice a staff there that looks a lot like a shepherd's staff, doesn't it? That's exactly what it was. See, because they would hold these things, and those were signs of their divinity. Those were signs of their royalty, that Pharaoh himself had a shepherd's staff. And he said, I am the shepherd over Egypt. I am control over Egypt. They go where I want to go. They, they follow what I say. And then also, Pharaoh then, when he was holding these things, he would say, I'm the one that brings the sun up in the morning. I'm the one that sets the sun down. I'm the one that's a mediator between me and the gods. And he had his staff to prove it. And now, there's going to be an 80-year-old man walking into Pharaoh's palace and says, I got a new staff. I got the new power of God here. The gods that you proclaim with your staff hold nothing against this. This is the power of God. And so God was saying, now Moses is now my representative. Moses is the mediator between me and the people of God. Moses is the one that's going to speak on my behalf. The staff was the power of God. And it symbolized that to them, and it symbolized it to Pharaoh himself that said, your staff has nothing against mine. But I happen to think, as Moses was walking all the way back to Egypt now, as he kept walking, he finally found Aaron, and Aaron was happy to see him. But, but I can't help but think that Moses was probably still a little bit nervous don't you think, after hearing all that, Moses probably was still not very sure of himself, thinking, God, you have picked the wrong person. God, I don't know how all this is going to work out. God, please just do something else. I, I can't imagine that he'd feel the feeling any other way because we'd just seen what was in his heart. And I love that we get to see this aspect of Moses because in the movies and the stories, we know it all by the Ten Commandments, him holding it up. We know it all about him walking through the Red Sea and great moments of faith. But that same man that did all that was the same man that was saying, God, please use anyone else but me. I'm not strong enough. And I love that because God loves to use normal people. God loves to use people that don't feel like they have it in them. Let me just remind you of a few and then we'll be done. If you know the Bible well, you know the story of Adam and Eve, right? They lived in a perfect world. Nothing was wrong. And yet still somehow they sinned. They sinned in a perfect world. Like, what could be wrong with them? But yet they, they sinned. But God didn't say, you know what? I'm going to scratch that and start anew. He said, no, I'm still going to use them. We go on a few chapters in Genesis. We get to Noah. Noah's the only righteous man in the whole world, the Bible says. And then the ark came and the flood came. And he, and he survived and, and he kept the human race alive. But after that, 
we find out that he was a drunk. <laughs> he, he planted a vineyard and he got drunk and, and maybe that's your story and I'm here to tell you that even with that in your story, God can still use you. God didn't abandon Noah. He, he, we go on further. We've seen Abraham. Abraham was a coward. I'm telling you, twice, twice people came and said, man, your wife is beautiful and he's like, that's not my wife, that's my sister <laughs> because he was scared that they were gonna kill him. Like, what type of a coward of a husband, a coward of a man and yet that's the one that God said, this is the people, this is the person that's gonna start my family. We go on. Isaac, his son, did the same thing. Jacob, his grandson, was a liar. He lied to his brother to get the birthright. He lied to his father. He was a liar his whole entire life, but his name was changed to Israel, and he had 12 sons that started the 12 tribes of Israel. We could go to Joseph. Maybe this is like your story as well, where it's not that you haven't done a major sin, but rather things have been done to you. Joseph got sold into slavery. Joseph was sold into, he was put inside a jail. All of these things, bad things happened. God shouldn't have used Joseph, but he did to save it. We, we could keep going on. We know Moses. Now we go to Joshua. Joshua, multiple times as he was coming inside a nation of Israel, God had to say, Joshua, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Again, I say, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Are you sensing a theme here? That God loves to use people that don't have it. Oh, that aren't strong enough. We could go on and go, look at David. David was the youngest of the family out of all the brothers in the family. And you would look at David and you'd say, David, he's the last person I'd pick as king. And he was the mighty king, David, that killed tens of thousands of warriors. We could go on, Elijah struggled with depression, wanted to kill himself. But Gideon was so scared that he couldn't be used by God that he was hiding inside of a cave in broad daylight because he didn't want the enemy to find him. God loves using people like this. God loves using people like you and me. We could go to the New Testament with Peter, always sticking his foot in his mouth, always doing the wrong thing, uneducated, nothing to offer. And God said, you are going to be the mouthpiece for this new church. We could go the exact opposite. Paul, who is well-educated and, and articulate, the only problem was he had a bad habit of killing other Christians. God loves to use people. We could go through church history. Billy Graham went to school 30 miles away. He preached his first sermon over in Palatka, and a man after his first sermon came out to Billy Graham and said, I don't think preaching is your thing, son. <laughs> he could use a little boy that had a speech impediment to say, I'm going to be a pastor someday. I guarantee you not very many of my, of my Sunday school teachers thought that was going to be the case back then when they couldn't understand a word I was saying. God can use you. God will use you because he doesn't need ability. He needs your availability. He needs your yes. He's, he wants you to say, God, I will go. If you call me to go, I will go. If you call me to give, I will give. Whatever you call me to do, I will do it. And I'm going to trust that you're going to be there with me. Because if you're there with me, there isn't anything that can stand in the way. With every head bowed and every eye closed, as the band comes on up. Let me ask you, what, what's your staff? <laughs> What's in your hand right now? What has God given you? What relationships are there that still need the gospel preached in them? Is it your job that you know that you can help serve and do ministry even through that or witness to your coworkers? Is it, is it the neighborhood that God has put you in? What, what, what has God put in your life that you need to say yes to? That you need to say, God, you can use this. God, I'm giving this over to you. Maybe some of you is going to be coming out to evangelism on Saturday. You know you needed to evangelize and you never have. And this is a good opportunity for you. Maybe some of you have been waiting to give and until the economy gets settled down. The economy is never going to settle down. You need to say yes to God. There's so many things. I don't know what God's laying on your heart but he does. Father, Lord, I, I thank you and I trust that while I've been talking, the Holy Spirit is working. And, and so, Lord, I pray whatever conviction is on each and every one heart right now, that they would say yes to you, whether that is just to believe for the first time and put their faith and trust in you, or whether it's to say, you know what, I'm gonna take a step of faith that might seem crazy, 
but I'm going to believe that you are in it. And so, Lord, whatever that conviction is, whatever you're laying on in the heart, Lord, I pray that you would give them the boldness and the strength to say yes. I pray that even today that they would also go back and they'd tell their spouse, they'd tell a family member, they'd call a friend and say, listen, this is what God's going to call me to do. Will you help me? Will you keep me accountable? Will you walk through this with me? Lord, we want to be a people that's used by you, just like Moses and every single person in the Bible They weren't perfect, but they knew the perfect one, and that was good enough. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.